Good morning. Welcome and thank you for coming in person and online and at our broadcast location at Lehigh Campus to the Primary Children's Pediatric Grand Rounds. This is the annual Intertwined Collaboration Lecture. I'm Miguel Canonkel, the Pediatric Hospitalist and the Course Director. Your claim credit code is 33018 for everybody to claim. If you have questions in the live chat, you just type them in there online. In the auditorium, just raise your hand and we have the overhead mics to pick up your question. We do have a broadcast location at Miller Campus of Primary Children's Hospital in Lehigh. It's on the first floor, north end of the hospital. And uh, it's the uh, Motorzyski Family Education Center. Next week, March 28th, is Doctor's Day. Happy Doctor's Day. 7 a.m., we will have breakfast at that same location at Lehigh and here at Salt Lake Campus, uh, first floor in the alcove part of the cafeteria, 7 a.m., nice breakfast for you. And then at 7.45 in the auditorium here is the Physician of the Year Awards, just right before Pediatric Grand Rounds that starts at 8 a.m. That's next week on the 28th. Please nominate a safety hero when you see a use of zero harm error prevention technique. This story I'm gonna tell you is a stop and resolve the most commonly used technique, and this is from our PACU. So a patient was prescribed a pain pump after surgery. The pump has the injectable anesthetic that goes in a slow rate into a, a specified site. We have an order set that requires the pharmacist to manually add the device itself into the ingredient list. 
the order was received and verified, but didn't have the pump added, and so it was prepared in, in an IV bag, so it looked like it would be like for IV administration. And this was sent to the patient's bedside and could have been administered intravenously, um, but the PACU nurse recognized that it was an error and it was different, and so they, once obtaining an IV bag, just practiced a stop and resolved, uh, called the pharmacy, and then the ropivacaine was prepared in a pain pump instead. So that was a good use of stop and resolve that prevented an error. And now Dr. Angelo Giardino, our child abuse pediatrician who's chair of department of pediatrics, will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Miguel. This is a really exciting lecture. We have this every year, and we call it the Intertwine Series. And this is a, a, a lecture series that goes through our Grand Rounds um, program, and we invite one of the formal partners that Primary Children's has to speak. So since we initiated this in 2021, we've had Dr. Beckerley from the Huntsman Cancer Institute, we've had Dr. Marla DeYoung, who's the Dean of the College of Medicine, and we've had Dr. Mark Rackbeport from Huntsman Mental Health. And today we have Dr. David Steinberg, who serves as the Chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and the Executive Medical Director of the Craig H. Nielsen Rehabilitation Hospital. He specializes in neurorehabilitation and pain management. Dr. Steinberg has a special interest in physician wellness and leadership development, the implementation of evidence-based initiatives to improve quality, safety, and operational performance, and integrated health system strategic planning. He is an experienced physician leader with demonstrated skill leader leading a thriving department and medical staff. Dr. Steinberg graduated from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and completed his residency at Northwestern University and the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which is a big deal because RIC is like the top program. Uh, he holds board certification from the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and a subspecialty board certification in pain management. He earned his uh, Master's of Medical Management from Carnegie Mellon University. And prior to coming to the University of Utah, he had many leadership roles over 23 years at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor. And uh, he is a really valued friend and uh, a true leader at the University of Utah School of Medicine. So David, we look forward to hearing Thank you. It's great to be here. I very much appreciate it. Um, I will not start with a joke about the two department chairs and the administrator, but great to see you, Dustin. Thank you for being here. And I will tell you, I participated in the Safety Hero Awards a couple of years ago. What an amazing uh, program and just uh, really proud of what you all do here at Primary Children's Hospital to serve the community and our patients. So thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, first a big shout out to uh, our partners in um, in the rehabilitation department. So thank you very much for being here and joining us today um, to participate. I'm going to be covering a lots of territory, but the main goal is to have fun and learn a little bit together. Um, and I've, I've violated all three rules of like PowerPoint slides. So you know the 10, 20, 30 rule. Um, so way too many slides, too many words, and um, but we'll have a great time learning about it. So I have no financial disclosures. Uh, these are a few of the important people in my life, lots of my family in this photo, including a donkey, um, and the, um, the administrative uh, help in our department that really can't get anything done without it. So uh, very much appreciate uh, their help. So today we have an agenda to go through some of the history of uh, PM&R, uh, we'll talk about structure, mission, uh, and I really want to get into a little bit of discussion about uh, inequities and disability, really important, especially with a DEI, uh, the importance. And the disability population is one of the most um, uh, important um, uh, underrepresented groups. Um, and there are many uh, systemic factors that impact their well-being. Then I'm going to go into a deep dive about the Nielsen Rehab Hospital. That'll be the promotional part of the talk, like a big advertisement. Um, and then we'll do uh, rapid fire some photos, talk about innovation and a few other things, and then strategic planning. Uh, I know some of the audience are nurses, so I have some very specific uh, content to focus on that population, so very much appreciate that. So we're going to talk about who we are and what we do, uh, why we do it, uh, how we do it, what we want to become in pm &R, um, and how we aim to do that. So strap in and let's go for a ride. So what is uh, physical medicine rehab? Anyone? Colby? Uh, it's also known as physiatry or physiatry. There's been a 
decades of argument. How do you pronounce the word? Uh, we are physiatrists or physiatrists, uh, also known as P, M, and R. And there's some history about why we are emerged like a weird name like that. Um, so ChatGPT, the, the root of all knowledge, says a medical specialty that focused on restoring functional ability and quality of life to individuals with physical impairments or disabilities. Uh, comes from the Greek, uh, physikos and iatria, art of healing. Uh, what do we do? Well, we help people regain function. We optimize quality of life. We treat the whole person, not just a problem area, very holistic. And more than anything, we lead a team of medical professionals. Interprofessional practice is sort of our, our core. Uh, we are non-surgeons, um, just to, in case there was any confusion in the room. Uh, and we obviously, core to my uh, practice is we treat pain and manage it uh, as best we can, and many disabling conditions across the lifetime. You ever been on an elevator and you say, what, who are you, what do you do? Uh, so my first, uh, my first exposure to PM&R, I, I was reading a book in medical school about specialties, and I read about this. I think I was a, a first year medical student. I said, well, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and things change, right? So you get exposed to the field of the a broad practice of medicine, and I was really drawn to the holistic care. But we're nerve, muscle, bone experts, treat the, in, the, the injuries and illnesses that affect how you move and function. Our goal is to provide medical care to patients with pain, weakness, loss of function, to maximize physical, psychological, social, and vocational potential. So obviously very holistic. Um, the biopsychosocial uh, scope of medicine really comes to bear. When I'm talking to patients, who are facing like the biggest challenge of their life, um, perhaps a patient with a new spinal cord injury or a head injury. Um, I talk about the two sides of the coin and what we do in rehab. What every patient wants first is to be restored. They want to be normal again in some way. Sometimes that's possible. Many times it's not possible. So then there's the other side of the coin, which is learning to compensate or learning to live with your problems and reinventing yourself in a new framework. Many people describe rehabilitation or, you know, the journey once you've had a, either an illness or a disabling condition as like Alice in Wonderland. You've crossed into a new reality, and you turn around, and the door's closed. You cannot go back. Um, and that's the world of the physiatrist, is how do you help those people um, move forward in a positive way and reinvent themselves and find joy and love and all those other things. Historically, we have a fascinating history, and I've learned... So what did I learn from getting ready for this uh, uh, talk? I learned about the history of PM&R, and Frank Cruzen and Howard Rusk, really fascinating. They come from the two different perspectives of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Frank Cruzen represents the physical medicine world. Frank, is a fascinating guy, was planning to be a surgeon, um, but he developed uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, and that derailed his... Uh, his uh, career when he was in medical school, and they sent him off to a sanitarium. And he said, this is fascinating. There's so many ways to help people recover, not just through surgery. And he changed his mindset about what med medical practice could be and should be. And he really got it delved into the physical modalities that help people recover. When he came back to Philadelphia, anyone from Philadelphia, Angela? Yes. So he actually, at the age of 28, became the associate dean of Temple University. Amazing, right? Transformed that medical school within two years to be one of the top medical schools in the country and eventually was recruited away, like many people, to the Mayo Clinic and became actually very close to the Mayo brothers, um, but really invented many of the uh, core um, modalities that we then use today. Um, and really explored that in very in, in depth and became a pioneer in the field. Uh, in fact, he was the first sports medicine doctor ever. So when he went back to Philadelphia, he became the team doctor for the uh, Temple University football team, FYI. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, Howard Rusk uh, had a much different course, and he represents the rehabilitation side of things. So he was living in Missouri at Wash U, St. Louis. He was an internist, and he uh, started, he, he, became, he joined the Air Force, essentially, in World War II. And working closely with... Um, uh, with Dr. Rusk, but also, excuse me, with Dr. Cruzen, um, and also with FDR, they formed um, Air Force rehabilitation programs and, and really uh, promulgated that across the country. So fascinating history. Um, World War II and the polio epidemic really catalyzed PM&R to what we are today. 
Um, lots of professional organizations were formed, including the real AAP, the Association of Academic Physiatrists. Whenever I type that into the Google, right, I get into the pediatric world. I'm like, wait, no, no, no. Okay, but lots of uh, legislation was really important to recognize the needs of the disability population. Uh, in 1973, the Rehabilitation Act, and in 1990, under one of the Bushes, the ADA, critically important for recognizing rights of those who live with disabilities. Um, here at the University of Utah, we were formed by the legislature in 1957 uh, to help care for injured and disabled minors. So first and foremost, we are a workers' comp program, right? We're here, we exist at the university because of the mining industry in Utah, um, and lots of people experiencing disabilities and problems. So the legislature established a land trust and said the University of Utah shall in perpetuity care for injured and disabled minors. So in all of my other hats I wear, I'm also the head of the Miners Hospital, which is kind of cool. Um, I've never been in a mine, but someday I think I will. Um, Jim Swenson, a relative of yours, uh, Colby, uh, was our first division chief. He actually trained under Howard Rusk. So um, he's really a fascinating guy um, and developed a first independent division here at the University of Utah. Interestingly, that's the same thing that happened at the Mayo Clinic in 1936 because there was a battle between two departments and they couldn't figure out who owned physical therapy type things, uh, orthopedics, and what was the other department, you think? Correct, radiology. Because why not? <laughs> But radiology was using lots of uh, diothermy and electrical therapy and other things that radiologists do to help fix people. And so the two divisions couldn't get along, and that's why they recruited Dr. Uh, Cruz in there to sort of fix, you know, make, ha help everyone get along, right? That's the job of department chairs is to make peace with people who are arguing. So in any event, Dr. Swenson came here, developed a division, and then over time, we got an amazing gift from the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation to build our new rehab hospital, um, and we've been formally recognized as a department as of 2022. Okay, moving right along. We have accredited fellowships. In, uh, in our department, we have spinal cord injury medicine fellowships, sports medicine fellowships, and a new TBI fellowship that'll be starting soon. Um, oh, by the way, we would love to have a uh, pediatric Rehabilitation Fellowship, so more to come about that. We also have non-accredited fellowships. Uh, our largest one is our spine, Interventional Spine Program, which is a direct uh, de um, descendant of the physical medicine side of rehab. Um, it's thriving. We do lots of things in that area and very excited about it. So we do, like many pl uh, places in medicine, we do both inpatient care and outpatient care. We really, you know, across the continuum of care, um, from the acute care hospital experience where we are in, you know, doing consults for people with acute problems in the ICUs, all the way through their continuum of care into ambulatory settings, uh, post-acute skilled nursing facilities, you name it, a pm and doctor has a role. So really important there. We also specialize in uh, electrodiagnostic medicine, so we do lots of EMGs. We do a lot of interventional things more and more with uh, spinal interventions. And we here in Utah, believe it or not, have the largest intrathecal baclofen program in the country. So when you combine our pediatric and adult practices. And it's very important because spasticity is one of the most uh, devastating uh, uh, consequences of many neurologic conditions and other problems. So we're blessed to have lots of resources here to be able to serve those patients. Our department serves a broad continuum of care from the traditional rehab type things, spinal cord injury, brain injury, all the way through uh, electrodiagnostics, interventional spine, everything that I talked about. And believe it or not, we have a very large psychology division with both rehab psychology and neuropsychology. We also do health psychology. Um, and our partnership over here at P uh, Pediatrics, we have many of our patients also receive P uh, psychology services uh, from uh, your department and uh, providers. Our department is growing. We're small, though. We're, we're smaller than some of your divisions. So we have 33 physicians in total, um, both on the rehab side. We have five physicians over here in the PEDS rehabilitation area, 10 who focus on pain and uh, musculoskeletal spine work, eight over at the VA, and we're actively recruiting and growing. We have nine psychologists in our department, which is pretty large considering our size. We have a growing uh, research uh, arm as well as a very strong um, educational mission, and we're, we're thrilled to be on a growth trajectory. So what is our mission? We are committed to delivering exceptional medical and neurological rehab care, as well as spine, sports, and musculoskeletal treatments. We're dedicated to advancing an impactful patient care education innovation 
etc. So we're on a mission. What is our vision? We strive to be a top 10 academic program in the country. Um, we are a premier academic p and program. We just had our match and we did exceptionally well. I'm not allowed to say exactly how well we did, but wow, we are thrilled. Um, we deliver patient-centered care propelled by unprecedented advanced technology, and I'm going to get a deep dive into that technology in just a little bit here. So. Uh, so why do we do what we do? Because we really deeply care about people who are um, faced with physical and uh, cognitive disabilities. So we know that there's lots of reasons that people face, you know, challenges that they face. And um, those inequities come from structural factors, social determinants of health, and other risk factors. We know that people with disabilities are more likely to have these risk factors. They smoke more, they have poor diets, they, they drink more, they lack physical activity, and they face many barriers in their community. Um, in fact, my first exposure to rehabilitation was not in the United States. It was in the USSR. Any of you know what the USSR was? So <laughs> it was back when I was in medical school, I got a little flyer. It said, hey, come to Lithuania to, you know, um, to go kayaking. I said, what is that? But my, my peeps are from Lithuania. I said, okay, that sounds really cool. It was sponsored by the uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and they were talking about why it was important to end nuclear war. I was like, okay, I can sign on to that. But they happened to bring a whole bunch of disabled people, spinal cord injury patients, with a physiatrist, the first time I met a physiatrist. Um, but I want to tell you that the barriers in that culture to people who had disabilities were unbelievable. If you had a spinal cord injury, you had no rights. You had, you, why would you need to go to a restaurant because you never left your home? The wheelchairs didn't even have wheels that you could self-propel because why would you need to push yourself around in a wheelchair other people push you around passively. There was no vocational uh, options. You weren't expected to vote or go to the library or anything. So many barriers. Uh, but that exists in our country as well. So many barriers. It's a, it's a big problem. Lots of barriers in our own health system as well. Lack of knowledge, negative attitudes, discriminatory practices. It's hard. Many of our patients have language problems or hearing difficulty, uh, visual problems, uh, difficulty accessing health care. So that's why I'm here, to convince all of you to become um, you know, strong advocates for those who are facing physical challenges and other problems. Martin Luther King himself said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Guess what? If you invest in this area, there's a big, big return on investment. A 10 to 1 return is um, if you put inclusive practices in and, uh, and develop some good preventive care uh, to help our patients. Family planning and vaccinations can be very cost effective in this population. Um, and advancing health equity helps all of us. Rising tide lifts all boats. It's really important. So what is it like to live with a disability? It can be very, very challenging. We know that uh, they face many uh, barriers and their uh, differences in their behaviors. And that compared to living without a disability, life changes in an instant. Um, Patients with uh, disabilities are more likely to experience social circumstances that put them at risk for other poor health outcomes. This is my shout out to the general pediatricians in the crowd. So we know that people with disabilities come from families that often are living in poverty. They have lower education levels, they have income challenges, their food insecurity are big problems. Many of these size dif or these differences can be avoidable if you can understand what uh, patients are going through. So what's really important to recognize in my faculty is that a visit with one of our families with a, a child with a disability is comprehensive. It requires a good listening, lots of time and patience, and a team. It's really important to have that kind of approach to this. So there's lots of people with disabilities. 1.3 billion across the world. That's 16% of the world's population have disability of some type, one in six. We know this is increasing as well, and we I suspect it will be even more in, uh, prevalent with uh, climate change and the impact on those with disabilities are uh, vastly outnumbered. You know, if you think about Katrina and the population that was at greatest risk were those that were living in nursing homes or those who had physical challenges and could not flee the floodwaters. So um, it's actually very, really a big problem. And in many places, those with disabilities uh, have a mortality rate that, you know, they die 20 years earlier. Um, they're twice at, as likely to develop secondary health conditions like depression, asthma, diabetes, stroke, um, so, and transportation. I mean, all of us came here somehow this morning, but if you have a physical disability, 
the barriers that you face to get to work on time or to get to a doctor's appointment on time are 15 times more challenging. So we have to be aware of that. In the United States, there are 21 million Americans living with disabilities, 7% uh, of the population. 5% uh, have cognitive problems, hearing problems, vision difficulties, and problems with self-care and living independently. We know that with aging, uh, the rates of disability increase dramatically, and I'll show that in just a little bit here. In Utah, one in four have a disability. Again, higher risk for secondary conditions, and we often, these patients are, don't have great access to pr preventive health care. Even dental checks are more challenging and difficult for this population. Uh, but we have a bold statement by the legislature that to be healthy, all individuals with or without disabilities should have opportunity to take place, to take part in meaningful daily activities that add to growth, development, fulfillment, and community contribution. So in Utah, cognitive disabilities are the most prevalent, followed by mobility disabilities. We know that they increase with age, especially for those 75 and above, very high rates of disabilities. The demographics, we know that families are greatly impacted. Almost a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter of families have at least one member uh, with a disability. And in Utah, one out of 14 families has someone who suffered a traumatic brain injury. Labor participation is about half the rate of those who don't have a disability. People who have disability uh, families often live in poverty. and We know that poverty is a risk factor for so many medical conditions um, and stress. Adults with disability are more likely to have depression, obesity, smoke, diabetes, heart disease. It's not a great recipe. So we need to turn the tide on this and focus on it. Uh, but again, you know, it's big impact on the economy of Utah, $4.8 billion a year. Not much of that spent in the rehab hospital, but <laughs> across the, the state, especially for Medicaid and nursing homes and other things, 29% of the healthcare spending is spent on this population, um, about $14,000 per individual with a disability. So um, we know this will increase with time. It's negatively correlated with education and income. Um, and uh, it varies by ethnicity. The Hispanic population has a much higher rate of disability, as well as race. And our um, American Indian and Alaska Native population uh, is uh, at a much higher rate, much higher risk. And lots of health uh, harmful exercise, uh, harmful behaviors such as smoking, eating fewer fruits and vegetables, and getting less exercise. In my dream world, we'll have a, a farm cart in the lobby of the rehab hospital. I'd love to have that. It'd be great. So lots of factors impact disability, aging, access, cost, prevention. So what are we going to do about it? This is where we came. This is the old school of medicine built in 1965. Big wrecking ball is coming. They're going to tear it down soon. So what are we going to put in its place? This was our vision. This was the rendering of the Craig H. Nielsen Rehab Hospital. You think we did it okay? This is where, what it looks like today. So come on over. I want to give tours. You're about to get a ride and like learn all about what we have inside this amazing facility. So really cool. We've got a great front yard, uh, so come on by. We've got a beautiful garden that lets our patients get some fresh air. And after patients have been in the ICU for a couple of weeks, oh my gosh, feeling the sun on their, uh, on their face is really, really important. And having a vision for recovery. Uh, this hospital is, uh, instills hope, and we are, it's just jam-packed with technology and great people that help to make it good. We've already been recognized. Press Ganey gave us an award. We're already on the best hospitals in the US News and World Report. We've got lots of accolades. We're super excited. We're car for credited. Uh, we're well on our way. And we've got great outcomes. This is just a little uh, snippet of what we do in spinal cord injury. Uh, we have about 160 patients a year, about a four week length of stay. Um, and we have pretty good patient experience scores, 94%. Um, when we compare ourselves to the spinal cord injury model systems, we excel. So we bring our patients to the rehab hospital sooner. We rehabilitate them more efficiently. We have great outcomes with a higher percentage of discharge to home um, and um, a, a lower rate of discharge to back to the acute care hospital. Why do we do that or how can we do it? It's because we're connected by the, to the acute care tertiary hospital by a sky bridge. Many of the top rehab centers in the country are very distant from their main hospital. So if you get sick in their gym or in their hospital, you know what they do? They call 911. It's kind of crazy. Um, 
but we have embedded within our hospital acute uh, critical care physicians, pulmonologists, um, and great access to subspecialty care. In our brain injury population, about 250 per year, we have similarly great outcomes. A, a shorter length of stay, between two and three weeks, but again, very high patient experience scores, which we're really proud of, and a rather high percentage of discharge to home. If you look at the bottom line here, comparing ourselves to model systems, we have a much higher case mix index. We're developing special programs like a, dis, a, a DOC program for dis, uh, disorders of consciousness. So patients who are emerging from coma can come to the rehab environment and benefit from the MLU and the specialty services so that they can avoid going to long-term acute care hospitals or skilled nursing facilities. So that leads to really great outcomes. I want to tell you a little bit about some of my patients. This is the, pa this is the audience participation. So pay attention closely. There'll be a question. Okay, this is Ben. Ben was a rock climber. He and a buddy went climbing in the uh, Tetons, um, and he was really thrilled. This was in 2022, 24-year-old guy. He slipped and fell 300 feet. Bad injury, really bad injury. So, you know, EMS was called. They sent the helicopter. They had to evacuate. This could be any one of us or our kids, um, and in fact, sometimes it is. Ben was a wreck. So he emerged from coma. He was already developing spasticity, uh, joint contractures, lots of cognitive problems, feeding problems, skin issues, you name it. And by the way, I'm sharing this because Ben has given approval, so just FYI. So he came to the rehab hospital um, and he got to work. And our teams got to work. And we got him on our, some of our really specialized equipment. This really cool device is a body weight supported treadmill that has augmented reality built into it. And Ben started talking as he emerged from his coma. He said, I want to run again. And the therapists were like, well, let's just get you to transfer safely first. And maybe you can walk to the bathroom. Like, let's not put the cart before the horse. But he kept focused on the idea that he wanted to run again. And this was his, his you know, absolute, like, um, a laser focus on this. And he said, I'm going to participate in the 2023 Salt Lake City Marathon. And he did. He, uh, he finished in just over four hours. And it was just a remarkable journey to recovery. Really exciting. Um, so this is another story about a patient um, that we treated, uh, Connor Fields. Connor is one of the most decorated Olympians in the United States history. Gold medalist in the coolest sport ever, if you've never seen this, BMX bike riding. Any BMX riders in the audience here? Not me. <laughs> so uh, you have to be just absolutely fearless, right? Because you're pedaling like, like a crazy person around a track, and it just looks like devastating risk, and it is. And Connor caught the wheel of another, another bike rider, and he went down hard. This was in the Tokyo Olympics. He was unconscious on the track, live streamed to billions of people around the world. Um, and so they life flighted him out of there, got to a hospital in Tokyo. This was right in the midst of the COVID pandemic, by the way. So when he, get, when he gets injured, where does the US OPC bring him? Brings him to the rehab hospital here in Salt Lake City. And Connor's back on his bike. He's one of our spokespersons. He's thrilled with his recovery. Um, he's done really, really well. Really quickly here, this is another one of our patients. Um, this is Sarah. Sarah was injured in a, a drunk driving accident. She was a high school senior. She suffered a spinal cord injury and a bilateral above knee amputations. So complicated that her care couldn't be managed really at any other rehab center in the Mountain West. She came to the Craig Nielsen Rehab Hospital and had really an amazing outcome. In fact, she went back and participated in her high school prom. Um, and now she's in college, she's at Utah State, she's really a wonderful young lady, another one of our spokesperson. Okay, audience participation. What do you, what's the connection between these three individuals? Okay, they're young, they're active, seem to be pretty happy, they're, you know, we signed them on as spokesperson. But what else? What do you notice? Anyone? They rehabbed at our center, correct. What's most important to me is when I see their, their pictures of what they consider themselves to be like, okay, I'm on the journey to recovery. It's doing something that they love. So Sarah went back to cheerleading. Connor went back to bike riding. Ben went to running. Like they're connected to their activities. Like many of us here in the audience, we, we identify ourselves with the things we love to do. I know for Angelo, it's going to great restaurants. Uh, you know, I know many in the audience probably have other things that they enjoy doing. For me, I love to hike and, you know, I'm a rower. 
but we often define ourselves through our activities. So that's really a big part of what we do in the rehab environment is we want to find out what's important to the, each person so that they can identify what's the pinnacle of their self-actualization. Identity and satisfa satisfaction of our patients associated with regaining their social, sports, and recreational activities. So it's really important for us to understand what each individual's needs are because we know that people with disabilities have the same desires that we do. They want to have a stable, fulfilling identity, to be independent, to be loved, and to love others, um, and to be successful. And from the very start of my rehab training, this was drilled into our mind about how we needed to get into the shoes of our patients and, and understand their lived experience and help them fulfill what was important to them. The only difference is the ways that our patients need to achieve these things. And that's why we have lots of adaptive um, opportunities for our patients. So what do we do for the rehab hospital? We have lots of bells and whistles. Now hold on to your seats because I'm going to show you some of the cool technology that we have. Um, so beautiful hospital. And I think in the far distance is Primary Children's Hospital just over the, over the top there. Um, this is an image of Craig Nielsen, our founder. So he was in a wheelchair himself. He founded Ameristar Hotels and Casinos. Any of you been to one of their hotels and casinos? Amazing hospitality. So his legacy built into our hospital is to have it a premier, beautiful facility that doesn't feel like a hospital. So he went back to running his uh, corporation from his power wheelchair and never looked back. And he wanted to have those same opportunities for patients that would come uh, uh, after him. So we have a beautiful lobby, doesn't feel like a hospital. We have lots of cool technology, including the longest zero G body weight support system in the world. So this is a place where patients' eyes get big, where their families say, wow, that has possibilities for me to recover, really instills a lot of hope. And our therapists love working in this environment. It's bright, sunny, lots of great uh, bells and whistles. We even have that zero G over stairs. The engineers at the zero G company said, we can't do that. We said, yeah, well, we think it's important. Let's think about how we might be able to do it. So it really helps patients recovery, um, which is wonderful. And of course, we have a nice garden. When that old school of medicine gets torn down, we would like to build a new garden with uh, really cool pathways that are like a mobility course for people in wheelchairs. So I'm planting seeds here because, you know, peds rehab is important also. We ought to make sure we have lots of um, uh, bells and whistles and technology and a beautiful environment for patients along the continuum of care. We do outdoor therapy when, when the sun is out uh, here in Utah. It's most of the time. And, you know, lots of patients need to learn how to transfer an, uh, airplane seats. So we have these airplane seats that are donated by Turkish Airlines. You love it. They even have ashtrays. <laughs> Too wide, yes. Yeah. So... It takes a village, right? So we have lots and lots of people, lots of disciplines that participate in rehab here. Um, and I want to just give you a little bit of background. I know we're going to be short on time here, but let's talk a little bit about spinal cord injury because it's like we came from a, a foundation committed to spinal cord injury. There are roughly about 18,000 new spinal cord injuries each year, and about 300,000 individuals live with spinal cord injuries um, in the United States today. Uh, the average age has actually gotten older. So back in the 70s, it was like 29, and now it's 43. Um, this is a, really a male-dominated injury, so about 78% uh, of individuals with spinal cord injury are male. 24% um, occur in non-Hispanic blacks, which is higher than the population of 13%. Motor vehicle accidents are the number one cause, uh, but also falls, uh, assault of trauma from gunshot wounds, um, and more and more uh, sports and recreational activities, especially here in Utah. And the highest risk for someone in my demo age demographic is mountain biking at Deer Valley and going over the handlebars. <laughs> so luckily when I went over the handlebars, I just tore my rotator cuff, but I'm slowing down. Okay, average length of stay, as we saw, ours is about four weeks nationwide. It's depending on what type of injury you have, it can be as short as two weeks. Back in the 70s, it was like three months. In many parts, even in Switzerland, patients with spinal cord injury will stay eight or nine months. So there's quite a disparity across the country. The most common injury is uh, um, uh, tetraplegia, incomplete spinal cord injury to the cervical spine. 30% of patients with spinal cord injury are re-hospitalized uh, one or more times during any given year. Their length of stay can be over two weeks if they're rehospitalized. It's often due to uh, genitourinary problems or skin breakdown or other problems of that nature. 
um, respiratory, circulatory, musculoskeletal diseases. And historic lifetime, this won't come as a surprise to you. If you have a high cervical spinal cord injury over your lifetime, you could cost $5 million uh, for recovery. Um, and so it's, it's a big impact to the economic uh, well-being of any community and to families um, who cannot afford the type of care. 24-hour care has big impact on families. If you have someone who suffers a traumatic spinal cord injury where they need around-the-clock care, uh, around care, often that means that one of the family members needs to drop out of the workforce to become a caregiver in the home. So it has a big impact on the state economy. Life expectancy as well is reduced if you've got a, um, a devastating spinal cord injury. In some cases, 20 years, 30 years uh, less over time. What do we do in the rehab hospital? Is we have that team who helps to kind of like provide care. But our philosophy is not just like um, transactional care during the acute care, but really continuum over long time. So. Uh, we start seeing them uh, in the acute care hospital, and then we have services that we provide to them for their lifetime, including trying to do kind of a complex care model so that we can be their medical home for primary care in the rehab hospital. We have a seating mobility clinic, mobility garage, driving evaluations, comprehensive work. We have very strong educational resources. We do prosthetic and orthotic fitting, including our own 3D printing, so we can do in real time get people devices that they need. Uh, we have very strong uh, supportive disciplines like occupational therapy and speech therapy, very similar to the type of team that treats the pediatric population here. We have very strong work on psychology, uh, including marital counsel, sexual health, uh, fertility clinics, uh, so that we many of our patients desire to start families. And so we need to help them through that process. We help to manage their problems over time with medication management, nutrition, vocational, et cetera. Very comprehensive. Go to our website, you'll be able to see more information. This is one of those really bad slides. I don't imagine any of you can read those words. I apologize, sorry. Uh, we use lots of adaptive technology, and I'd like to show you some of that. We are driven to innovate. So we want to make sure that our patients can get out in the world. This is a picture of Becca. She's a C3 spinal cord injury, ventilator dependent. This is within just a couple of weeks of her injury during her acute stay at the rehab hospital. We brought her down to our mobility garage. We put her onto a ski and her eyes got big. She said, I can ski again? Are you kidding me? And it's true. We got her out skiing, and now she's one of, she's actually almost a world champion in her new class of competition. Didn't exist before. But this device that she's sitting in is called the Tetra Ski. And we bring people out into the mountains across uh, the Wasatch uh, skiing. We have also put that same technology on sailboats and kayaks. We work with our engineering partners um, at the university to create new ways for patients to access the world. I'm sure, it's going to. Yell to the rescue. Um, not, you shouldn't. There are some. But oh, not, yeah, this yeah. is okay. Oh, I see. Okay. There may there are some with embedded videos, and I'm trying to just race through those. So, okay. This is our digital innovation lab and assistive tech lab. So we do lots of virtual reality and augmented reality here. Really cool. If I'm closer, they can hear me better Sorry. probably. Okay. Um, and this becomes an immersive experience for our patients during the hospital. This is kind of like the Apple store for patients to understand what adaptive and assistive tech can do for them. Really fun place. And if you, can, you can't really see it in this picture, but we have 3D man that we use for uh, educational purposes to project um, um, autonomic dysfunction uh, for patients to learn about that. This is that uh, uh, treadmill device that I showed you earlier, the first of its kind in the Mountain West, really amazing. This is 3D man. So we teach people about uh, autonomic dysreflexia, which can be a devastating problem um, for patients. We have a fabrication lab right in the rehab hospital that we make the Tetra Ski and other devices. We have 3D printing here. We're actually now, and thank you to the pediatrics department, we are applying for a USAID grant to help uh, Ukraine understand how they can make real-time prosthetics to help their patients with Dr. Hansen's leadership and others. We're hoping that we'll be helping um, that community because there's so many individuals with devastating limb loss. But our mobility our garage includes this fabrication studio, which is cool. So we make devices in real time for patients during the rehab stay to customize what they need with their orthotics and their braces and things of that nature. 
lots of cool things that get attached to wheelchairs. This is mobility garage allows us to show off some of our cool rec and sports equipment. And I see Russ Bitter Butterfield in the audience. Your population loves these things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this Tetra ski. So we have our national championship coming up this next week. We have 35 participants. Half of them are kids with muscular dystrophy and other neuromuscular disorders. This is great. Um, I have a video that shows the youngest person ever to use our Tetra ski, four years old. Pretty awesome. This is what one of our hospital rooms look like. Our hospital rooms are big. They're beautiful. But the most important thing is you can control everything in that hospital room through, from an iPad. So you think about your Siri device, you know, in home, you can turn your lights on. It's kind of a fun trick. But our patients who are stuck in bed really need to be able to turn the lights on and off and open and close the blinds, change the uh, temperature, open and close the door. So if the doctor or the nurse leaves it open, patient can have privacy and close it from their bed. Really important. So we've worked a lot on these, our computer scientists and engineers, developing this user interface. And if you're really cool, you don't say user interface, you say UI, right? Okay, but this user interface can be put on someone's cell phone and it, we had to really think this through about what types of controls patients really want. This is sort of like the TV remote on steroids. So if this will work, that would be really cool. I don't know if it will or not. Yeah, that's okay. But uh, this is actually Rachel who works in our department. She demonstrates how to control all those cool things in the, in the room. So we've uh, embedded voice control on that iPad as well as a sip and puff controller. So patients who really lack any hand function can control the iPad and control their world. Our mantra is control everything with anything. So we're all about how we can master the human machine interface. The hospital is a type of a machine. We want patients to be able to control the hospital and the hospital itself becomes part of the care team. We have been recognized as the most, did, um, most wired hospital um, in the United States, and that's much to do with the work of the rehab hospital. So we're really proud to be on this list. At the University of Utah Health, we serve about two million patients a year. So the power of information, the power of data, the power of the voice of the patient, and how we collect that and deliver that to our teams is critically important. The patient experience can't just be the work of a small team or a few individuals. So getting feedback into the right hands is so important actually to make a change. Partnering with Qualtrics. So basically what that does is we use that iPad and we said, oh, by the way, this can be a two-way communication device. So patients can get right into their iPad and they can give us real-time feedback about their experience. The TV's broken. There's a spill in the room. The doctor was rude to me. Whatever it is, we want them to feel free to kind of like speak up. The most important thing for them that we found is they want to express gratitude. But they do that. We have embedded it on the iPad. You know, this, the current, so Dustin, pay attention. Currently, the, the state of the art for patient surveys is like a week or two after you leave the hospital, they get a mailing, like, please survey, tell us how it was. We do it in real time. Qualtrics has like gotten their eyes big about this, and they're embedding this in their tools and learning how you can get real time feedback from patients and families and respond to their needs. And what we found is that they want to express gratitude more than anything else. But this goes directly to the department manager. So if there's a problem, you know, if a patient has an interaction with a nurse that didn't go just right, it goes to the nurse manager right away. And the in real time, they can come and intervene. So it's really important. And it's just one of the things that our technology has opened up. This standard for these rooms is easy. It's not that expensive. It increases the uh, patient experience dramatically. Oh, this other thing, RTLS, we can track our patients. <laughs> So they actually like that, So, uh, but also our staff, we're into like tracking this and we're studying this about how we can improve efficiency in the rehab hospital through tracking. We have lots of cameras and we're embedding AI in the cameras, so that's really cool. Um, I'm going to tell you, I've got so much more content and I know that we're going to run out of time, but I'm going to fly through a couple of things. So what do we want to do in the future is we want to make turn our smart room into a wise room by using AI. So we can watch patients' behaviors and we can make the room calming when patients are getting agitated. And when uh, patients need to be more stimulated, we can open the blinds and turn the lights on. And when the doctor comes in, we can turn off Fox News. And you can play my approach music when I'm walking in. <laughs> so really, really cool things that we're going to do. Lots of research uh, possibilities for us. We're going to embed more languages through our um, uh, iPad interface. 
and we're going to integrate it throughout the hospital. That iPhone uh, controller that patients have right now allows them to call the elevators so that a patient who has a spinal cord injury is not limited to staying in their room. We want them to have freedom to move about the hospital. We're also, by the way, going to be building a really cool new residential facility called the One U Center. More about that later. We have a really cool gate lab in the rehab hospital. We call it the Art Studio for Advanced Rehabilitation Therapeutic Studio. Russ, this is your space. So it's really a wonderful collaborative space. It's all about sort of how we can work together, uh, getting researchers having uh, being in that space. So really excited about this space. We've uh, brought engineers into our team who are working on brain-machine interfaces, um, lots of work on neuroprosthetics uh, that really can be life-changing. And now patients who have, with some of these devices can actually feel their prosthetic hand. So this is like Lee Major, if any of you know, remember the $6 million man. This is the $6 billion man. So it takes you to another level of magnitude. This is our trails program, which is our sports and recreation program and the Tetraski device. We're all about innovation and um, how we can uh, get patients uh, more active in their, in their life. Their mission is important, right? What does Tesla do? They accelerate world's, world's transition to sustainable energy. They're not a car company. They're transitioning to sustainable energy. What does trails do? We are creating a world free of barriers for people with complex injuries and illnesses. We are committed to this. This is that national championship next Friday up at Powder Mountain. Uh, will be really, really fun. 35 international athletes, half of whom have um, MDA or other neuromuscular conditions. Really excited about this. Let's talk a little bit about PEDS rehab. I'm going to be cutting short, but I really want to talk about this. The patients that you treat here over at Primary Children's Hospital often have CP, spina bifida, uh, cystic fibrosis, lots of illness or trauma-acquired illnesses. Um, the teams here really have to focus on improving the quality of life for, children's adolescent, for children, adolescents, and their families, really a holistic approach. It involves the entire family. The practice of uh, rehabilitation nursing in the pediatric, depart, uh, pediatric environment is much more comprehensive than probably any other area, I think, in peds nursing. The mission is to collaboratively work with the interdisciplinary team to provide a continuum of care um, and to help patients or children, regardless of their disability or chronic illness, to reach their maximum potential over time. Developmental theory is really critical in this population, so our peds nurses really have to understand where patients are on their, their continuum. Um, because we know this is a major disruption to the family and to the developmental um, course of uh, individuals that have these uh, types of problems. So there's, it is a very comprehensive practice for pediatric nursing. Uh, so the pediatric nurse is an advocate, is a researcher, team member, care provider, consultant, coordinator. So. It's super important. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Uh, concepts are that, you know, of course, just like the mantra for, the, uh, for PCH, a pediatric rehab patient is first and foremost a child. We need to recognize their needs as a, as a, as a child. They have intrinsic worth and value to themselves and their, and their families and society, an integral part of the uh, family system. And we cannot separate them from their family. So it's really important for the family to be engaged and involved in the treatment plan, probably more or as much as any other area in pediatrics. Uh, play is important as well, as well. Like, you know, that patient Becca, when she, you know, I told you, C3 spinal cord injury ventilator dependent, she was a professional skydiver before her injury. She said she was an adrenaline junkie. When she got on that Tetris key, she said, you know what, that was one of her top five experiences in her whole life. She is so passionate about skiing on that Tetra ski. It's given her, it gives her a sparkle in her eye. All of our patients need that, something that's fun, because a lot of times it's not fun to have a disability. So it's really important that we, uh, that we incorporate play. Uh, so concepts, of course, we need to kind of recognize that there's been lots of um, legislative um, uh, work in this area to recognize rights of families and patients with disabilities, including to recognize their special education needs. And a shout out to my mother, who's a special ed uh, specialist, uh, and so uh, really important for to have age appropriate um, learning levels uh, addressed through an IEP for our patients. We have to address lots of issues. The rehab doctor is also a consultant, a legal consultant, and so can the nurse at times. We have to deal with lots of issues about competence and guardianship, informed consent. Lots of these families are really interested in estate planning, advanced directives. They need to understand disability laws and how their child can learn um, in the school system. 
So transitions are really important. We're going to do lots of work over here to sort out how we can improve our transitions from uh, childhood to adult services um, to make sure that patients have the needs that they have across their continuum. We know there are lots of trends, and we're working on this um, with our partners at PCH to develop outreach clinics, to work on our transitions of care, to think about how we can improve coordination of care and follow-up. So lots to, lots to do there. We've done some work in the PEDS rehab group on our SWOT analysis and strategic planning. And if you had another half an hour, I can show you all of my slides about strategic planning. I have copies of our strategic plan out on the desk that you're welcome to kind of peruse through. Um, I didn't include a lot of the pediatric spe specific information in there, but we can get to that as well. So we know there are lots of gaps and opportunities in our program, and under the leadership of uh, Dr. Colby Hansen and the whole team, I'm just thrilled to be partnered with uh, PCH. So what we aim to do in pediatric PMNR is build a program infrastructure to support our clinical research and administrative activities, coordinate care across the continuum, serve our patients through outreach, grow our existing programs and develop new ones, be a leader in multidisciplinary care for certain conditions and improve our reputation na nationally through research and presentation. We have lots of work that I can go into, but I also want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to fast forward. So hopefully this isn't going to make you all dizzy. You can see I like to overdo it on the slides. But I want to just show you, I have references at the end of my slides, and that was an important part of our CME. So I want to just demonstrate that, that I, I pay attention to the rules. I'm a rule follower. So with that, I thank you so much. And Angelo, thank you for the book and for this opportunity to, uh, to share a little bit of time with you and introduce you to what we do in pediatric rehab and to our Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So thank you very much. I see your question there. Thank you. <laughs> Do I need the mic or can I use No, they can hear you. Oh, yes. I, I just want to say I um, worked at the rehab center back in Dr. Swenson days. I was one of the first recreational therapists hired there. So, of course, the physical therapist and occupational therapist didn't know what to think of me. And it was nice to see Dr. Swenson with black hair. I never saw him like that. And then um, also I, I walked over there um, I can't believe what a beautiful facility you have. And at one point, I looked out the window, and I could see the patio of the old rehab center. And I don't know. It was just sort of like I remember spending so much time out there having barbecues and stuff. And our patients were there for a long time back then. And I just thought if we could have had a vision to look out over that patio and see that building up there, what it was going to be like, I think people wouldn't have believed it. It's a miracle. But um, I just really appreciated your presentation to see how things have really improved and developed. And, um, you know, I have a lot of memories of people overcoming things, and I think you really um, showed what rehab can do. Well, thank you for your uh, kind words and for your contribution to our early days in rehab here. Um, I will tell you that one of the first things that I did as I bought a barbecue that we can, you know, have some community activities, because I think community is really important, and seeing how you all come together in your, uh, your area is really critical, because we have to care for each other if we're going to have the resiliency to care for our patients over time. And that, I think, is really critically important, especially in healthcare today. There's so many um, stressors and factors that are making it difficult to do what we do. And so I appreciate everything that you do to contribute to uh, you know, the care over here at PCH. Yes, sir. So, oh, David, could you tell us a little bit about the physician workforce issue? So, are there people going into pediatric PM&R, and, and, and how do we stay ahead of the curve? So, let me see if I can show you this one slide. Uh, the challenge is that, like many uh, areas of pediatric subspecialty, very few people are choosing to go into that. So, the pediatric rehab workforce is very challenged. There are fellowships in the country, but more than half of those fellowships have gone unfilled. So part of the challenge is the invitation for someone who's interested in going to pediatric rehab, and I'm one of them. When I was finishing medical school, I thought I wanted to go into peds rehab. They were the best docs I had encountered, and I thought it would be really cool to do it. But it takes four years of residency followed by two years of fellowship. And along the way, if you've got big medical debt, that's really challenging. And the reward for doing that is often a lower salary. So it's not surprising that fewer and fewer people are choosing to go into peds rehabilitation. 
we think we are also challenged here. You know, recruiting to Utah is not always the easiest thing either. And recruitment and retention is critically important for us. So we would like to help develop our own workforce and start a PM&R pediatric rehab fellowship, or perhaps we can think about an integrated residency. There's lots of opportunities for us. Um, the workforce has also expanded by using APCs more. That's true on the adult side as well as on the pediatric side. So we now have two nurse practitioners in our department who are really great contributors to our team. Um, and there may be other opportunities, but those are major factors. Um, I did look, there was one of our slides looked at the workforce, and I'm just going to see if I can find it real quick as I back up here. And we know, by the way, the demand is very, very high. Here's the, uh, the workforce slide. So um, nationally, uh, p uh, pediatric PMNR is the second most rare subspecialty with less than 350 providers listed nationally. So we're blessed to have five of those providers here in Utah. Other um, questions? Any questions with our online yes, viewers? Uh, yes, thanks for teaching us. I do have one online question. Before we get that, the, the claim credit code 33018. Um, what Are there any support groups or education or adaptations for disabled parents uh, for parenting skills or adaptations for them? I, I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer that question. I think the answer is yes. We have a very strong Brain Injury Alliance of Utah that helps uh, patients and families uh, of those who are struggling with traumatic brain injury. We have lots of support groups that are focused on uh, our population with limb loss and amputee. Um, and I do think that those are families of children with disabilities really need assistance. And I'm looking at Russ and thinking that your group probably also works closely with families. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience here? All right, thanks for teaching us. Have a great day. Appreciate you. Thank you all. The pleasure is really all mine. Yeah, and Appreciate we'll see you at Doctor's Day breakfast next week, 7 a.m., first floor of each campus of our hospitals. Bye. Yeah, that was, thanks. Really, that was